One of the most familiar arguments in the debate about whether or not Jesus existed is the silence of Paul argument. This is an argument for mythicism and focuses on what Paul did not say about Jesus, which one would expect him to say had Jesus been a real person who died shortly before Paul was writing. I cover that argument in separate videos, but here I will look at the related issue of what Paul did understand of Jesus, and specifically what he added to the Jesus story. An addition that we have to remove from Jesus if we're looking for the earliest form of Jesus that we can reconstruct. Paul's epistles are the earliest writings that we have that are by or refer to Christians. He gives us some clues to the time frame of the very early church. His writings are dated to the 50s AD, and here's what he says in Galatians 1 and 2 about time. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other apostle except James the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, The one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Chapter 2. Then after fourteen years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. So this gives us a period of around seventeen years, probably a little longer, between Paul's conversion and his second trip to Jerusalem. He doesn't give us any further information that allow us to say how long after the second trip the letter was written. The date of Galatians is debated and is usually placed between the late 40s and 60 AD. And this, combined with the time intervals Paul gives us, places his conversion generally somewhere in the 30s. And Paul makes it clear that he joined a religion that he started out persecuting. So he did not found that religion, and others, including Peter and James, were preaching this religion before him. As to Paul's view of Jesus, there are seven epistles that are generally agreed were written by Paul. In six of these, Paul is writing to churches or people that he's already familiar with, and he doesn't feel the need to explain the fundamentals of his beliefs in much detail. The one letter that Paul wrote to people he had not previously met was his letter to the Romans. This is the last letter of his that we have. Paul was planning a missionary journey to the west around Spain, and he wanted to use Rome as a base of operations, for which reason he wanted to secure the cooperation of the Roman church. A preoccupation that runs through Paul's letters is what appears to have been a bitter conflict between Paul's theology of justification by faith in Jesus, with no need to obey the Jewish law, and the alternative theology of the Jerusalem church led by James the Just, and also involving Peter, of a continuing need to obey the Jewish law, and to be circumcised. In his letter to the Romans, Paul sets out his position on faith in Jesus versus the law, but he tells us very little about what the opposing position was, and of course he never anticipated any debate about the historicity of Jesus, so he never made his position on that clear either. Paul's background was in Judaism, and in Judaism you have the law given to the Israelites by Moses, and some of them followed the law and were in good standing with God as a consequence. Others were habitual backsliders and required prophets to be sent to buck up their ideas. The whole nation could be berated and persecuted for backsliding, the faithful few notwithstanding. So, this is an understandable, reasonable, contractual arrangement with God. Paul comes along and says that nobody can ever keep the law, despite there being numerous characters in the Jewish scripture who were right with God for doing just that. That's why we need Jesus' death to save us. The obvious question is what then is the law for? Paul's answer is that the law is there to show us that we are sinners. In other words, it's a set of standards which we can compare ourselves to, and so show us that we are sinners and hence in need of Jesus.
Now that doesn't put God in a very good light, does it? Because it means he's persecuted all these people over the years for breaking laws that he knew they could never keep. This is something Paul invented. There is no hint of it in the Jewish scripture. But why did he invent it? The most likely explanation is that this was a rationalisation caused by his notion that faith in Jesus was a necessary and sufficient condition for salvation on account of Jesus' vicarious atonement for our sins. So, according to Paul, observance of the law is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition to be right with God. It wasn't necessary because faith in Jesus was a sufficient condition, and in practice it wasn't sufficient because nobody could ever keep the law. The church he was opposing took a different view. And while Paul does not explain what that view was, there are only three possibilities. The law was necessary but not sufficient, sufficient but not necessary, or both necessary and sufficient. As Paul's opponents were apparently insisting that the law must be followed, it must have been necessary. So was for them the law also sufficient? If so, then Jesus had no saving utility unless you broke the law. If not, then you needed to keep the law and have faith in Jesus. Well, we don't know what they believed, but we do know that Paul believed Faith in Jesus was a necessary and sufficient condition for being right with God, and we also know that an obvious corollary of this is that the law is redundant. This is obvious to us, it was clearly obvious to Paul, and so it will also have been obvious to Paul's opponents if they believe that faith in Jesus was sufficient for salvation. They did not believe the obvious corollary, so it would seem that they didn't believe the axiom either. Therefore, they don't seem to have seen faith in Jesus as sufficient, but it could still have been necessary. However, the position that faith in Jesus was not a necessary or a sufficient condition for salvation, and therefore Jesus did not supersede the law, seems to fit better with what we know of other early Christian writing. This is rather tenuous. Paul's epistles are by a margin the earliest Christian documents that we have. All four Gospels have adopted Paul's salvation idea, although in the case of Mark, the references that indicate this are very fleeting, there being only two. One in Mark 10. So this is when Jesus is rebuking James and John for wanting to sit on either side of him in heaven. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark's second reference to Jesus being a saviour is in chapter 14, talking about the Last Supper. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The scantness of these references to Jesus' saving function in Mark is a bit odd, given that it was supposed to be the main message, but anyway. There have been attempts to reconstruct Christian writings which may have been contemporary with Paul, such as layer 1, the oldest layer of the hypothetical Q source, and components of the Didache. In these, Jesus is not a saviour figure or even divine, but a stoic philosopher type preacher. So finally, getting to the point of the argument, which is that if we take away Paul's addition to the Jesus character, what we are left with is not a saviour figure. And if Jesus was not a saviour figure, it makes it less likely that he started out as a god. For a start, it means that all those arguments from precedent involving Zalmoxis, Adonis, Osiris, Mithras, Inanna and so on become moot, as we are no longer looking for a saviour precedent. Now we're looking for the founder of a religion who didn't have any specific divine gifts to impart to his followers, but rather who was interpreting or explaining the will of God. This sounds much more like a prophet than a pre-existing celestial god, and a prophet is a real human being. This conclusion is similar to that from the argument from Q, and it is that when you try to reconstruct Jesus, the earlier you go, the more man-like and less godlike he becomes, and this suggests that he started out as a man rather than starting out as a god.
this remains one of the stronger arguments for historicity and is one of the main reasons why the scholastic consensus is that Jesus did exist. The argument isn't often heard because for apologists, the notion that the whole idea of salvation by faith was invented by Paul is worse than mythicism. After all, a form of Christianity could be salvaged from mythicism, but not from the idea that salvation by faith and vicarious atonement was a man-made invention.